Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we're going to be bringing down the Players' Championship 2024 edition. This is the flagship event on the PGA Tour calendar, and I know that it used to have the moniker of the fifth major, and I know it's still an important event, still a huge event, but without the live guys, it doesn't really feel like the fifth major because the field isn't as strong as it could be. However, this is still the strongest field that we're going to see in a PGA Tour event this season. It is a full 144 player field with a cut, and so there is a lot of money to be made by playing DFS betting and one and done this week. So what we're going to do on this episode, we are going to break down the course itself, TPC Sawgrass, one of the most iconic courses in all golf. Um, and then we are going to look at some stats and look at some models of the golfers that we will expect to play well here this week. And then we are going to look at the board and talk about from a game theory perspective, how you can play DFS, who you should be targeting in DFS, who you should be targeting for betting, who you should be targeting for one and done and so on. So this is a full on preview for the Players' Championship 2024. Everything you need here in one place. Now, if you are new to the channel, please go ahead and subscribe. Um, that way you can be with us for the rest of our golf content throughout the PGA Tour season. Next week, we are going to have a ton of March Madness content as well. We are going to have a bracket breakdown show as well as a lot of college basketball DFS and betting content. So if you are interested in that, the NCAA tournament, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. That way you can be with us for all of that next week as well as the regular schedule golf content. So also while you're here, please, if you're watching on YouTube, hit the like button. It really does help me out a ton and I really do appreciate it. It helps the videos get noticed, helps the videos get found, and it just really does show me more support than you could ever know. And I cannot thank you guys enough for that. If you're listening on audio, go ahead and hit that rate and review button. Um, because of you guys, my podcast now shows up in searches. Um, so that really does help me out a ton and I really do appreciate it. All right. So um, let's go ahead and cut the intro there and let's go ahead and start breaking down TPC Sawgrass. All right, so let's go ahead and start by breaking down TPC Sawgrass. If you were watching on YouTube, Golf Digest a few years ago put together a great video that is a breakdown on TPC Sawgrass called Every Hole at TPC Sawgrass. Um, so I'm playing that in the background on YouTube. I highly recommend going and watching it with their audio as well, though, if you're interested in golf course architecture and how golf courses came to be. Um, it's Like I said, it's a great video. Anyway, TPC Sawgrass is one of the more iconic courses in America from just an architectural and, and visual standpoint. You know, it's got the island green, which is just one of the most iconic holes on earth and it's got just designed in such a way that provides a thrilling finish and it has hosted the players championship for about 50 years now and so this is an event that is truly one of the best on the calendar because it's played at one of the best courses on the calendar now, TPC Sawgrass is played in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida, which is home of the PGA's headquarters, um, which is just outside of Jacksonville. So this is North Florida. This is not like what we saw two weeks ago, at the Honda Classic in South Florida, or last week where Bay Hill was in Central Florida. This is North Florida. So the agronomy is slightly different. Um, this is a par two. It is 7,200-ish yards, more or less, depending on the day. So it's a pretty short course. And from the scorecard perspective, like you've got par fours of every distance. You've got par threes of every distance. And so um, pretty much the approach shots at this course, there's not really one bucket that you can put um, on approach this week because so many of the approach shots are going to come from very distances because that's how it's designed on the scorecard. Now, what is vital, though, is that you are going to have to score on the par fives, no matter what. The guys who win here tend to score very well on the par fives. They tend to be not very difficult. And they tend to be the places where most birdies end up coming from. So that is going to be something that is vital this week for scoring. Now, this course is a peat die design. And so there are a lot of intricacies with peat die design golf courses. Peat die really likes to mess with your sight lines. So there is a course near me um, that is a peat die design. I've played quite extensively called Ocalo. And this is just a public golf course in High Point, North Carolina. But it shares a lot of design similarities with TBC software. And you can see a lot of what P die designs in just, just that course, right? There's a lot of holes where it looks very narrow off the tee and it looks like there's a lot of trouble off the tee. And then you hit your tee shot and you're in the fairway and you look back and it's like, oh, I actually had a lot of room there. And then it's like, wait a minute, I had a lot of room if I took that angle, but I never would have taken that angle because that's where the trouble is. And now that I think about it, that's where the best angle to the green would have been. There's a lot of holes where you just the sight lines are messed with you like that. There's dog legs that, that require you to be creative and think ahead for your next shot. And generally speaking, 
what peak die designs require is the closer you are to the trouble off the tee, the better of angle you are going to have for your approach shot in the green. So if you're able to, you know, be aggressive and be very precise off the tee, you're going to set yourself up with easy approach shots, which these approach shots here at this course are not easy. Approach is going to mean everything here. And the reason why is because Pete Dye likes to get evil with pin locations. Um, he can put pins in a spot where they're very hard to go at, or if you miss, there's a severe penalty. And what I mean by that is like, it's not super thick rough here at TBC Sawgrass. It is thick by PGA Tour standards, but it's not like major championship standards. But if you miss the green, it's very rarely a flat surface. There's a lot of bunkers around the green. There's some water around the greens, and there's a lot of kind of humps and hollows around the greens. Pete Dye loves to put those in his designs where you have an uneven lie to stand on, and it's just really hard to get up and down from anywhere if you miss the green. So that's why there is such a premium on approach, which again, you can make your approach shots easier if you are able to be aggressive and take the right line and hit the right shot off the tee. So pretty much it from, you know, from T to from green to T, you set yourself up better for your, for your putting. If you're able to be aggressive and precise off the tee, this is a course where guys will swing less than driver off the tee. Um, Bryson DeChambeau a few years back contended for this tournament back in 2021, where he swung only a three iron off of the tee the entire tournament, because, you know, it, there's not a whole lot of holes where distance was to his advantage. So what he said was, okay, I might not be able to win the tournament with my driver, but I cannot lose the tournament by hitting three iron and hitting fairways and putting myself in really good spots to, to continue to attack these holes. And, and, you know, Bryson DeChambeau is a very mathematically oriented golfer. So it doesn't shock me that, you know, knowing what we know about Pete Dye designs, that he was able to take that approach. Now the greens are also something interesting here. So if anybody tells you that these greens are Bermuda, they're not quite correct. But also if anybody tells you they're POA, that's also slightly misleading as well. So these are not POA greens like you would see at Riviera or at um, Pebble Beach, um, you know, that we saw in the California swing. These are also not pure, pure Bermuda greens like we saw recently in the Florida swing with the Honda Classic and Bay Hill. I called it the Honda Classic. I know it's the Cognizant Classic. Um, but anyway, these greens are Bermuda with a POA overseat. The weather is such in North Florida that the Bermuda, the Bermuda grass is dormant this time of year. So they overseed it with a POA that enables it to grow in. And it's really like putting on carpet. It's really smooth. It's really kind of um, like svelte almost. And there's only a few courses on the PGA Tour that have this type of green. And it is the stadium course, PGA West, which is the home of the American Express, TPC Sky. Scottsdale of the Waste Management Phoenix Open, Copperhead, which is home of the Valspar Championship, and Harbor Town, which is home of the RBC Heritage. I'm no agronomy expert, right? But but I'm good enough to do enough research and know that those are the courses you want to be comparing putting stats to, not per Bermuda, not pure POA. Now, it's also worth noting that a, a big reason for that switch is because the tournament moved to March back in 2019. So there have only been four editions played at this um at this venue at this time of year um, and because the 2020 edition was canceled. Remember, Hideki Matsuyama had the first round lead and then Rudy Gobert got COVID and then the world got shut down. So um, you don't have a 2020 edition to go off of. But ever since the tournament moved to March in 2019, the four winners have been Rory McIlroy, Justin Thomas, Cam Smith, and Scotty Scheffler. That is an elite, elite list of winners, and they're all guys who were among the best players in the world at the time of their victory, and all of whom had great form coming in at the time of their victory. So when you are looking at you know what's going to play well here at this course, to me, there's, there's kind of a lot of things that are kind of separated here at Sawgrass. It is not really one course that I can comp it to. There is not really one style of play that I can recommend over the other. Because what you see is the winners at this course since it's moved to March have tended to be the best players in the world. The guys who have played the best, but not necessarily won, have been shorter hitters who are more accurate off the tee, who are good on approach, and who have the short game to be able to get up and down. When it comes to comparing it, there's three buckets that it sits in. This is a Florida course, like Bay Hill, like Copperhead, like um, PGA National. This is a TPC course. Um, there's a lot of similarities with that where, you know, you've got the stadium greens that are kind of lifted and, and they put the pins in kind of evil locations. And they've also got holes that encourage aggressiveness. A lot of TPC um, courses are designed like that, like Scottsdale, like TPC Southwind, like TPC River Highlands, the list goes on. And this is also a peak die course, which there's a lot of those similarities like we talked about, like TPC River Highlands, like Harbor 
Scarborough town. Um, so there's really not really one bucket that you can put this course into. And so it really casts a wide net in terms of who you can target. But here's the thing. This is not the course where you're going to be looking to get right. Like if you are not coming correct through this course and executing on every shot, it will eat you alive. There is water lurking everywhere. There are massive bunkers. There's somewhat thick rough and so you have to bring it every single shot to the green and if you look at what won here last year in scotty scheffler's victory ignoring scheffler you look at the rest of the top 10 they were pretty much all elite on approach except for Mimu lee um and then they were also all very positive off the tee as well you have to strike the ball well here at this course or you're not going to have a chance now what separated the winners from the guys who were not so great winning was pretty much most of them had either good performances around the green or good performances with the putter what is scary for the rest of the field is that scotty scheffler won this event and he was pretty much neutral with his putter that's what Scotty Scheffler does. If he's going to be neutral with his putter, he's going to beat you in every other aspect. Now, in terms of course history here at the players, this is a very volatile course for course history because of how much danger is lurking, how much water is lurking. The, you know, the best players in the world, if you're off with a few shots, you can miss the cut because of those, those water penalties, right? And also, there can be weather advantages here. Two years ago when Cam Smith won, weather pretty much wiped out an entire wave. Um, and so, you know, I can really forgive guys if you look in their in their worst finishes in 2022 because that, you know, if they were in the wrong weather wave, they were just screwed. Group for, for the rest of the tournament. Now, in terms of course history, the best guys here who have played in more than one event, um, so ignoring Justin Sutton and Minwoo Lee at the top who played here last year and were T6, the guys who have the best course history and played more than one event are Victor Hovland, Scotty Scheffler, Christian Bezayden, who Adam, well, Adam Svensson only played one, Hideki Matsuyama, um, Aaron Rye and Brandon Wu only played one event, and then Max Homa, Siwoo Kim, um, and Justin Thomas round out the list of guys who have played well um, in more than one event. Adam Scott also has pretty good history here. Tom Hoagie, um, Tommy Fleetwood, Corey Connors, Jason Day also have good history here, but like I said, history here can be very volatile. Now, for the key stats at this course, um, I think it's pretty straightforward. I want to prioritize ball striking. Um, so strokes gained off the tee, strokes gained on approach. Um, put it to last whatever rounds, but I, the more recent, the better, because I want guys who are coming into this tournament playing good golf. Um, I also think strokes gained around the green is important. As we mentioned on these Pete Dye courses with all these humps and hollows, you're going to have to have some touch around the green if you want to be able to win this tournament. And you look at the list of a lot of guys who have won this tournament, it's a lot of guys who we think of as having good short games like Scotty Scheffler, like um, Ricky Fowler, like Jason Day, so there, uh, Cam Smith. So there's just a lot of guys who have good history here who have good short games. I also want to look at par five scoring because it is a super important stat to be able to score on the par fives. That's where you're going to be making your birdies. Course history here is not all that important. I'm very much prioritizing recent form. And if you're looking at comp courses, like I said, there's three buckets that you can put this course in. Florida courses, I think the best one is PGA National. TPC courses, I think the best one is Scottsdale. Pete Dye Designs, I think the best one is TPC River Highlands. And then there's also been weird crossover success at Sedgefield and YLI. I can't really figure out exactly why both those courses are pretty narrow off the tee. They're not super long um, and they do test all ranges of approach. So maybe there's a little bit there, but if you look at winners at that course, there's a lot of them in common. Siwoo Kim has won at Sedgefield and um, the players. Um, Justin Thomas and Cam Smith won at Wyalot and the players. So um, let's go ahead and we're going to take a deeper look at some of these stats on um, the rabbit hole. Um, so we're going to take a quick breather and then we're going to dive down the rabbit hole. Now, if you've been with us for a few weeks, you know that when I say go down the rabbit hole, you know I mean that quite literally because BetSpurtsGolf.com um, has a site called The Rabbit Hole where they allow you to do all different kinds of filters and conditions and um, kind of find the exact stats that you want for a golf course as well as um, you know, kind of put that into a custom model and see just um, how all these golfers are, are shaping up for the week. So what I do is I'm going to kind of try to cherry pick different aspects of this course, um, tell you what guys rank high in it, and then build out a custom model and, and we'll see who comes out on top. Spoiler alert, it's probably going to be Scotty Scheffler. So um, what I do want to prioritize this week at Sawgrass is recent form. So in the last 20 rounds, the best golfers in the field in terms of strokes gained total have been Scotty Scheffler, Matthew Pavone, Justin Thomas, Colin Morikawa, and Tom Hoagie with Doug Gim 
Xander Shoffley, Jake Knapp, Eric Van Ruyen, and Shane Lowry rounding out the top 10. Y'all, I'm just going to say it straight up. I think on DraftKings, Matthew Pavone is a misprice sitting at $6,700. He is coming into this event with absolute dynamite form. Um, he has won an elevated, or not an elevated event, but he won a pretty tough field at the Farmers and then almost won an elevated event the next week at Pebble. Um, I think this guy is legit. I think he's actually pretty good. And at $6,700, I think he is probably the misprice of the slate on DraftKings. And I think he is a guy that you can legitimately bet as an outright to win this tournament. Now, we also said that I want to prioritize approach. So who have the best approach players been in the field in the last uh, 20 rounds? That has been Tom Hoagie, Scotty Scheffler, Jake Knapp, Tony Finau, and Andrew Novak as your top five, with Carson Young, Nick Taylor, Corey Connors, Austin Ekro, and Colin Morikawa rounding out the top 10. If you make the list just ball striking, you get a lot of similar characters. Scotty Scheffler, Keith Mitchell, Tom Hoagie, Tony Finau, and Siwoo Kim um, coming in as the top five. Now, in, if if we kind of start filtering just a little bit, let's look at par five birdie or better percentage. We know that we're going to need to score in the par fives this week, right? So in the last 30 rounds, which should take us pretty much um, through the calendar year, um, the best guys in terms of par five birdie or better percentage have been Jordan Spieth, JT Poston, Taylor Pendrith, a guy who has sneaky good course history here, Tony Finau, and Patrick Cantlay. Um, I'm uh, that's a pretty good looking list to me. The, the, those, those are guys I'm definitely going to want to target this week. If you're curious, Scott, Scotty Scheffler was six. Um, he, he doesn't place very outside a whole lot of metrics except for putting, which if you include last week's putting, maybe it's pretty good. Now, I do want to look at just TPC courses now. So who have been the best guys in terms of strokes gain total at TPC courses in the last four years, which includes all editions of the Players Championship that have been played since then? Um, and the top five are Scotty Scheffler, Justin Thomas, Xander Shoffley, Patrick Cantlay, and Hideki Matsuyama. Now, what aspect of TPC courses do I think will play the most important here this week? I think it's approach shots because I think that hitting approach shots into these greens where they get dastardly with the pins, where they, um, you know, look to have these elevated greens in stadium settings. I think that's the most aspect that the TPC course kind of plays into it. And the best approach guys on TPC courses have been Russell Henley, Justin Thomas, Will Zalatoris, I haven't said his name yet, Keegan Bradley, and Jordan Spieth as the top five. Now, if we were to just make it instead, Pete Dye courses. Who have been the best golfers at Pete Dye courses in the last three years? Xander Shoffley, Brian Harmon, Scotty Scheffler, Sung M, and Patrick Cantlay. For Pete Dye courses, I want to prioritize off the tee play as well as around the green play. So the best off the tee players, you know, where he uses these funky sight lines, you know, to, to kind of mess with guys' heads. The best off the tee players have been Sung M, Colin Morikawa, Brian Harmon, Scotty Scheffler, and Victor Hartman, or Victor Hoblin, excuse me. What is interesting about that list is it is not a bunch of long hitters. It's a bunch of guys who keep the ball in the fairway, keep it in play. Um, and, you know, Sheffler and Hovland are long enough, but they're not like the longest guys on the PGA Tour. So it's interesting that that, that off the tee list definitely prioritized the accurate guys. Now, for around the green play, we mentioned that Pete does love to make around the green play tough. Um, the top five in that category are Jason Day, Minwoo Lee, Ben Griffin, Scotty Scheffler, and Harris English. Hopefully you're getting a lot of names that you can look at uh, for your lineups or your betting cards this week. Now, we're going to get a little bit more specific here. So we're looking at courses that are not driver heavy, that have a high missed fairway penalty, because whether you're in the water, a bunker, or the rough, missing the fairway is crucial here. So who have been the best guys in stroke skin off the tee when there is a high missed fairway penalty and they're not swinging a lot of driver? That has been Scotty Scheffler, Corey Connors, Rory McIlroy, Cameron Young, and Sung J M as that top five list. Now we're going pretty much tee to green here. So the last thing is the greens themselves. Um, so looking at the four courses that have the same agronomy as this course on the greens, um, which is the Pete Dye Stadium course, TBC Scottsdale, Copperhead, and Harbortown, the best guys in the field in strokes gain putting have been Sam Burns, Billy Horschel, Tommy Fleetwood, Sam Ryder, and Brian Harmon. So very eclectic list there, definitely with um, Sam Ryder giving us a name near the bottom of the board on DraftKings that might get a potential boost because he has putted well on this grass before. With Sam Burns, Billy Horschel, and Tommy Fleetwood, that doesn't exactly surprise me to see them at the top of this list because they have had a lot of good performances at those courses, specifically Sam Burns at Copper. So um, definitely an interesting list for sure. Now, if we put all that into a model, and this is the first version of my, well, the second version of my model. It is not the final version of my model. I do tinker with this um, throughout the week. Um, but right now, the top 10 in my model 
is Scotty Scheffler, number one, no surprise, Justin Thomas, Hideki Matsuyama, Doug Gim, and Keegan Bradley as the top five. Seeing Doug Gim come at number four is um, very interesting, but he's got great recent form. He's got good history at the comp courses, good history at this event. So um, definitely he checks a lot of boxes that I had here on this model. The rest of the top 10 is Patrick Cantlay, Will Zawa, Torres, Colin Morikawa, Corey Connors, and Tony Finau was very happy to see Tony Finau popped up because he did pop up at a lot of um, the individual stats themselves. Now, if you're curious, Rory McIlroy was a little bit of a, a red flag here in the model. Um, he ranked 40th, but to me, there's an exact reason why. His approach play just hasn't been great recently. And so when you weigh that approach play pretty heavily and it hasn't been good, then he's not going to come out well on the model. And, but, you know, he's still a guy who has won this event before. He's still a guy who's one of the best tee to green players in the world. Um, and so I, I do think he's a guy I'm still going to consider, but I just need to understand why he did not pop in my model. And I do need to know what I need to change if I want Rory to end up popping up in my model. Or, or what would be even more interesting is if I change it to try to get Rory to pop up and he ends up not popping up. Now, what I do want to get out there also is, like I said, I'm going to tinker with this model throughout the week. So if you do want to know who the final top 10 of my model is, as well as who my DFS core is for the week, head on over to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks. I write a full article for every single PGA Tour tournament where I profile, you know, my end of week key stats, the, the top 10 for the model, as well as the DFS core. So if you want to get that, um, head on over to the Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks. All right, so we've looked at all of the stats, y'all. So now let's take a look at the board and figure out who we need to be playing and betting on this week. All right, so now looking at the board on DraftKings, this is a, another week in pricing where they went back to the $12,000 range at the top and the $5,000 stone minimum, and they priced Scotty Scheffler all the way up to $12,800, which is... I think the highest I've ever seen a golfer not in the Tour Championship where they have starting strokes. And um, I still don't know if it's like high enough to prevent people from playing Scotty Scheffler. Like he, what he showed at Bay Hill was that when he gains a lot of strokes putting, he is going to lap the field. And so pretty much he had one of the best putting weeks of his career at Bay Hill. And he is so good at the rest of his game. Great off the tee, great iron player, great short gamer that just when he's gaining with the putter, nobody else stands a chance because the rest of his game is clicking pretty much all of the time, right? And you look at what he did last year at the players. He wasn't even as good a tee to green at the players as he was at Bay Hill. And he was a neutral putter, and he still won by five shots. That's just how good he is. So I, when it comes to betting, I generally don't think it's mathematically sound to bet favorites in a golf event. Um, but if there's ever a case to be made for a favorite, it's 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 this week because Scotty Scheffler, he just turned in one of the best putting performances in, of his career after switching the putter. However, putting is very volatile, but he's shown the ability that if he just puts neutral, he's going to win the event. And so I, I think if there ever were a week to bet the favorite, this would be it. If there ever were a week to play the favorite in DFS, this would be it because he's just – He's, he's on an incredible run right now. Like if he were winning more, we would talk about him in the conversation of like the run that Tiger had in his prime, but, but he's just not winning as much because of the putter. Well, now he may have fixed the putter. Like, like if I said enough about Scotty Scheffler and, and the fact that he's, he put well, like, I just don't think I can say enough about it. In the betting market this week, I think the without Scotty Scheffler market is quite interesting. Um, you're not losing that much odds on a guy, and, and I think it's probably more mathematically sound long term to bet in the win without Scotty Scheffler market than to try to pick a winner and have it not be Scheffler and be one of the other guys like that. Like the, a lot of sports books are offering the win without Scotty Scheffler market, and I think that's a very sound market to go to this week. Now, Rory McIlroy, we talked about why he didn't pop up in the model, and you can see why in the data his approach play has not been all that great. However, what is interesting is I do think he kind of punted away the round on Sunday at the Arnold Palmer. I don't think that um, you know he was fully locked in on Sunday and fully engaged, and he did not have a good approach round. Now, what's also really interesting is that he had a big time putting week at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. He got a lesson from Brad Faxon, who was like a putting legend before that tournament, and ended up putting really well. If Rory can put it all together, like the put it all with the the driver we know he always has, the approach play that can or cannot be there with the putter that he showed at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Rory could absolutely win this event as well. And I think he's an interesting pivot off of Scotty where he is so far priced below Scotty. Rory's a lot closer to the rest of the pack in pricing than um, 
you know, he is to Scotty. And I think he's a lot closer to Scotty in, in ability level than he is to the rest of the pack. So I do think that's an interesting, interesting play this week in DraftKings is to play Rory McIlroy. Now we have talked about this before, but I'm out on on Shoffley and Cantley. I'm just out on them. They're going to show up on every data, every model that you do, all the stats, because they are well-rounded golfers. They generally do not turn in poor weeks in in any of the aspects of their games. And so whatever you do from a statistical standpoint or a modeling standpoint, they're going to look good because they don't have the numbers bringing their averages down, right? But they just don't win golf tournaments. And at, at the end of the day, if you're looking to bet a winner or build a winning lineup in DraftKings, you're probably going to need the winner of the golf tournament. I played Patrick Cantley last week in one and done at Bay Hill, and I was immediately kicking myself immediately afterwards because he just he doesn't win golf tournaments. And so I, I'm kind of out on those two guys until they start winning. That, that's just me. A guy that I'm not out on, though, is Justin Thomas. So Justin Thomas has had absolutely elite iron play in, in the last few months. And you look at when his best putting weeks have occurred, it has been on the surface um, that he's going to see this week was very good at American Express, was a slight positive at the Waste Management Phoenix Open. So if you're giving me Justin Thomas on a really good surface for him with the approach play that he's shown lately, we know he's a great TD Green player. Um, I am here for Justin Thomas this week, and I think that with the way DraftKings did pricing, there's enough value plays that you can even play Scheffler and Thomas or McElroy and Thomas in the same lineup, and I think he is a very, very mathematically good bet to win this golf tournament at the number he's at compared to the numbers that some of these other guys are at. Speaking of good bets to win the golf tournament, let's talk about Will Zalatoris. So Will Zalatoris, through in the time that he's been on the PGA Tour, has been a guy who can have these absolute spike weeks on approach. And if the rest of his game can just hold serve, he can win the golf tournament. And in the Genesis Invitational, he very nearly did that if Hideki Matsuyama didn't go nuclear on Sunday. And guess what? Last week at the Arnold Palmer, the approach play was still there. So if we're continuing to get this continually good approach play from Will Zalatoris, he is eventually going to win a golf tournament because he does have that ability to do so. Um, last year at this event, he made the cup but finished 73rd because he was just awful on the greens. That was when he missed like every putt and went viral on Twitter for some of them. But I'm willing to give him a pass because if you look at what he's done historically at this event. He's historically been a great approach player at this event. So I really like Will Zalatoris this week. He is probably one of my favorite bets to win this golf tournament. Another one of those is Max Homa. So Max Homa is like a guy that nobody talks about. I think he's a really sneaky play on DraftKings because I don't think he's going to come in super highly owned, and I really like what he's done lately. The approach game for Max has been on point lately, and we know he's a good driver of the golf ball generally. We know he's a good short game player generally, and he can have spike weeks putting, which he did have a really good week putting at the Arnold Palmer Invitational in route to his eighth place finish. So if Max can just marry all those in one week, he's a guy who does have the upside to win this golf tournament because, oh, by the way, he has won an elevated event before. And you look at his history at this event, it's been deceptively good. 13th and 6th in the last two years. So Max Homa checks off a lot of boxes for me. We're going to talk about him. I think he's one of my favorite one and done plays this week more on that a little bit later sam burns i also think is a really really good play this week so if you look at what the stats we did on the rabbit hole earlier burns was like at the very top of the putting on this surface of grass and you look at what he's done recently and, and it matches that you know if he doesn't put two balls into the water at the american express we're looking at that as a win and, and as opposed to a t6 and we're looking at him entirely differently for the next two months but you know the arnold palmer invitation was a poor performance from him but before that he had had four straight top 10 finishes and the iron play is just such right now that burns is so good at the rest of his game driving and putting that I have confidence that if he can keep that iron play going, he's eventually going to find himself in the winner's circle. So why not on a surface that we know he has historical spike putting rounds on? Sayat Tagawa, I think, is a very interesting one as well. So he played this event last year and made the cut but finished 74th. Was, was not good. But think about what we know about Sahit since then. He is a guy who has turned into a boom or bust iron player who is generally pretty good off the tee and who is generally a pretty good short game player and can have spike weeks putting. Well, what would happen if he had a spike iron week and a spike putting week? You get like what happened at Phoenix where he finished in fifth place. So I think Syed does have the legitimate upside to win this golf tournament. And Pete Dye courses in the past have been pretty good to him. He's played well at the Travelers Championship. He's played well at TPZ Scottsdale, which is another one of my comp courses. So I really do like Syed Tagawa this week. 
But the guy that I probably like the most out of anybody else in, in the 8 to 9K range is a guy that uh, nobody's really talking about right now, and I hope they continue to not talk about him, and that is Tony Fina. So, look, I got to admit, I like Tony Fina. I'm gonna always going to be a little partial to Tony Fina. I, I just think he's a good guy. I hope he wins a major one day. Um, you watch him on full swing. He's 100% likable. I have not seen season two yet because I refused to pay for Netflix and I got kicked off my dad's account. Dad, if you're watching this, hook me up with Netflix again. Um, so um, looking at Tony Fina, I got sidetracked there. He has just been an elite iron player since the calendar year turned over. Um, gained at the American Express, gained almost 10 strokes on approach at the Farmers, almost eight at Pebble, almost five at Genesis, and then a little over four at the Mexico Open. That is just incredible. And the problem is with Tony is he always seems to give it all away with the putter. Well, what happens when he doesn't? He has the upside to win the golf tournament which he did at TBC Twin Cities a few years back, which is one of my comp courses. And last year, he was a positive putter en route to a T19 finish. So if he can bring the approach play that he's had in the last two months with the putting that he had last year, that is a recipe for success for Tony Finau, and he is one of my favorite bets and plays in DFS this week. All right, so that is the top of the board. So let's take a little bit of a breather, and then let's look down at some values at the bottom of the board. So a quick little bit about betting before we – um, carry on. So um, I do not think this is the week to do anything like a made cut parlay or anything like that because this event is so volatile that all it would take is one or two shots finding the water for one of the best players in the world and or one of the best course fits or one of the best recent form guys. All it takes is one or two shots for, for anybody like that to, to miss the cut by finding the water. So I don't think this is necessarily a great week to do something like that. I also think if you're going to bet a long shot this week, I think it would be very wise to put an each way on it. Um, as we mentioned in the four years since this tournament has been played in March. It has been one of the best players in the world who has won it. So um, am I telling you not to bet on long shots? No, but I do think that the mathematically correct play would be to put it each way on it and, and get a guy that um, has the upside to finish in the top two, three, or five. And if they lose to Scotty Scheffler, you're still getting something in return because let's be honest, everybody might lose to Scotty Scheffler. So um, looking down the board on DraftKings, Corey Connors is a guy I like a lot. He is like the Canadian shorter hitting Tony Finau right? He has been an absolutely dynamite approach player, gaining strokes in every tournament he's played in, dating back to the Open Championship last year. But he generally gives it all back with the putter. Well, what happens if he doesn't give it all back? He has the legitimate upside to win, right? Um, and you look at his history at the players, the one time at the players, he did putt really well. He finished seventh. So um, I really do like what I've been seeing out of Corey Connors. He is another guy I'm going to be playing a ton in DraftKings this week. Now, I think that with this being such an elite field, there's so many good options this week that like truly like I'm not going to fault anybody for for playing anybody in DraftKings. I think there's a lot of guys you can make a case for. Ben Ahn has been absolutely flushing the ball recently. Tom Kim, I think, is an elite course fit. Brian Harmon, I think, is an elite course fit. Keegan Bradley showed up on my model. Um, the rest of the um, like upper 7K range um, is really the – guys who fit the course well or have good history here but have not great recent form, aside from Tom Hoagie, who's been a dynamite approach player. So I think you can make me a compelling argument for like any of Poston, Cole, Scott, Kirk. If you're prioritizing recent form, though, those aren't the guys I would be going with. Now, the lower 7K range um, has a lot of like bet on talent guys like Eric Van Ruyen, um, Steven Yeager, Nikolai Hoygaard, Jake Knapp. We've got some younger guys, some up and coming guys who might just be very talented. And when we look back five years from now, might be guys that were like, oh, yeah, they were top 15 in the world back then because they're top 15 in the world now. Right now, a guy I do like at the bottom of the 7K range, though, is Cameron Davis. So Cameron Davis has been really good on approach in three of his last four tournaments. And you look at his history here at the players, he was um, T6 here last year, gaining a lot of strokes putting and a negative approach player. So if he can bring his recent approach game with the putting he had last year, he is a pretty good option here at this event. If you look at his history, what you see a lot of with Cam Davis is history where he is a long driver of the golf ball who plays well at short courses, which is kind of what this is, right? You look at what he did in the fall, you know, third at the Fortinet, sixth at the FedEx St. Jude, seventh at the Wyndham. Like that's exactly the kind of formula we want, right? So I do think that this is a great fit for Cam Davis. I think he's going to be a very good play in DraftKings this week. However, I think he's also going to be very popular. Now I say that, but there's a lot of guys 
in the upper 6K range that I think are going to be super, super popular. All right, starting off with Nick Taylor, who is one going to be one of my guys this week. Like this range is going to be the range of guys that I kind of live in, right? So Nick Taylor won the um, Waste Management Phoenix Open this year, and he's been a great approach player dating back all the way to, you know, the start of the calendar year at the century. And, you know, at the Arnold Palmer Invitational, of course, this should not fit his game very well at all because he's a shorter hitter. Um, he came in 12th place. And so whenever a guy plays well at a course that is not a good fit for them, to me, that's always a really good sign. Um, and you look at his history at this event, it's been a mixed bag, but he has finished 16th here. That was his ceiling back in 2019, the first time this event was played in March. So I really do like Nick Taylor this week. He has two wins at short courses at TBC Scottsdale and um, the RBC Canadian Open. So I really do think things are looking up for Nick Taylor this week, as they are for Doug Gim, who is rattled off four straight top 16 finishes heading into this event. And he has gained big time on approach in all of them. And oh, by the way, he also has a 6th and a 29th here at this event. So Doug Gim checks a lot of boxes. I think he's going to be a supremely popular play in DraftKings. And then Austin Eckroat is another guy that I think I like a lot and is also going to be positive. So we know he came off the win at the Cognizant Classic. You know, he was only, and I use the word only very liberally there, T36 at the Arnold Palmer. But what I like is he has sustained great approach play over the last month dating back to Mexico. He's gained at least one stroke per round in approach in every event. That's a really good sign. And this is an event when approach play is going to be at a premium. So I really do like Austin Eckroat. And then the last guy that I do like in this range is going to be Andrew Novak. So he's rattled off three straight top 10 finishes. And much like Austin Eckroat, the approach play has been what's carrying him. And and oh, by the way, one of them was at one of my comp courses, the Waste Management Phoenix Open. One of them was at another one of my comp courses, the Cognizant Classic PGA National. So um, Andrew Novak checking off a ton of boxes, in my opinion, going to be a great play this week. Now, if you're looking at that, you know, upper 6K range, like I said, those are going to be my guys this week. And and I still, you got Matthew Pavon, who I think is a supreme misprice. You got Luke List, who I think is a little bit of a misprice as well, been playing better lately. Billy Horschel, who t tends to play well at Florida, Florida courses, he popped up in the putting for, for this type of grass. And then Bo Hostler, I think is going to be the ultimate pivot. The guy in this range is going to go forgotten. And even he has had four, five straight top 40 finishes to start the year. So just a bunch of guys that uh, I really like at the top of this 6K range. And I think by playing two of these guys, it would be really easy to build a lineup with Scheffler and another one of the big dogs in it as well. Now, looking down the 6K range, a guy I do like quite a bit, but he does have a few red flags, is Andrew Putnam. So Andrew Putnam came in eighth at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. And like Nick Taylor, that's an event that he should not play well at as one of the shorter hitters on the PGA Tour. But he was so dialed in on approaching around the green that that kind of carried him, even though he was not great off the tee. The downside is with Andrew Putnam, we know he's a shorter hitter. We know he plays better at short courses, but at this event, he has yet to make a cut. So kind of a red flag there, but we know that the game's coming in at a better spot this time than it has in pretty much any other year. Now the lower 6K range, does have a few other like you know bet on talent guys like you got Maverick McNeely ramping up from injury Akshay Batia who I am a, a, obliged to mention every week even though he has not played well recently Rio Hisan Sune coming over from the DP World Tour who has played well recently Davis Thompson a young up and coming guy like Taylor Pendrith a, a guy who played well here at this event also so there's a lot of guys in the lower 6k range that you can just bet on their talent and go with and really I think that this week if you're looking to build a DraftKings lineup, I know pretty much all of my podcast today has been recent form, recent form, recent form. I think everybody is going to be on recent form, though. So if you're going to want to be different, you're going to want to play a few guys where, yeah, maybe you need to trust the talent or trust the course fit as opposed to the recent form because all the recent form guys are going to be popular. And to play a lineup that's slightly lesser owned, you need to find some of these guys that you like that are not coming in on good recent form. Now, we do have a 5K range this week. Adam Shank is a guy who let me down a little bit at the Arnold Palmer Invitational last week. Um, he did miss the cut, even though he was in position to make it after round one. But he's a guy who generally plays well at Florida courses. He made the um, BMW Championship last year and like... I think that he's bound to bounce back and start turning his season around at some point sooner rather than later. Um, the other guy I like in the 5K range is going to be Sam Ryder. He popped up on the putting part of my model, and the recent form has been a mixed bag. He has either finished in 31st place or better or missed the cut in his last five starts. So, um, you know, if he makes the cut, 
It's looking pretty good odds for him, right? Um, after that, there's really not a whole lot to like in the 5K range, in my opinion. I think I'm going to lay my hay in the 6K range. Carson Young is a guy who does play well at short courses. Um, Nico Echevarria is coming in on pretty good recent form. Lee Hodges, I think, is a little bit of a misprice down here. You know, finishing 12th at the Arnold Palmer should have gotten him a little bit of a bump in pricing. Um, and then if you're willing to really, really roll the dice, Hayden Buckley popped up on a, a lot of aspects of my motto with, you know, the shorter courses and the P die courses. And so um, maybe he might be worth a look also. Most recently, he missed the cut at the Cognizant Classic and came in 28th at the Waste Management Phoenix Open. All right, so let's take a quick breather, and then we're going to talk one and done and close this thing out. So it has continued to not be a great one and done season for me, but the good news is, is we've got plenty of signature events, plenty of majors left to make up ground. So I am not panicking yet. I'm going to continue to try to just play my strategy, play my game, and hope that the process um, yields some results. Now, looking at this week, if I'm being honest, this is one of the biggest purse events in golf, right? Like there's a ton of money up for grabs. If you get a winner this week, you're going to be in really good position. However, it's one of the most volatile events in golf. And so if you were ever to pick one of the big dogs, like the, the top golfers in the world, this would be one of the more likely than not weeks for them to make the cut, no matter who they are. Okay, maybe unless they're Scotty Scheffler, but no matter who they are, you're probably more likely to miss the cut this week than you would be at one of the majors or at certainly another signature event where they're either like cutting 20 guys or they're no cut events. So I don't know if I necessarily want to pick from the very top of the board this week and, and burn Scotty Scheffler or Roy McIlroy or Victor Hovland because there are going to be a opportunities to use them down the road and b those opportunities are not as volatile or as risky to use them, and I can still get a similar purse if I'm able to pick a winner. So I need to get a little creative this week. I already mentioned I am really not a fan of Xander and can't play this week. Um, and so after that, who can I go with? I think that this would be a great week if you have Max Homa available to pick Max Homa. Looking at the rest of the schedule, there is nowhere I would be willing to use Max Homa except for except for the Wells Fargo Championship or maybe the BMW Championship, but that, because that's a course where nobody has any history. So um, I think this is like Max Homa week if you have him, in my opinion. Um, I think that Brian Harmon's a pretty solid course fit, but I think there's other places we could use him down the board. I really do like Jordan Speed this week. This is an event where kind of a, a short game field type of golfer like him can have a lot of success. Um, Keegan Bradley, not a bad week for him. He popped up in my model. Sam Burns is an interesting one. I think this is a great Sam Burns week in one and done. However, I also think that there are two really good courses to use him at remaining on the schedule in Copperhead, which is next week, and the Vals or not, not the Vals Bar. Yeah, Copperhead is the Valspar Championship. Um, and then the other course would be the Charles Schwab Challenge for Colonial Country Club, where he has also won. So um, I think this is a very good week for Burns, but but if you want him for either of those two events, you, you do need to to save him. Um, I do think that it is likely that Justin Thomas and Jordan Spieth are in both of those events. Um, so I don't think that Burns would be like the only option in the field for those events, but um, I do think that those are great places to use him. We already mentioned I do like Sahit this week. I do like Tony Finau this week. With Finau, you would probably only be saving him for 3M or the Houston Open or the Rocket Mortgage, where he has won before. So um, if you have Finau available, that would be probably the, the events that you would want to use him at. Um, and then Will Zalatoris, I really, really do like this week. So we mentioned at the start of the season how with Will Zalatoris, he wasn't originally in all the signature events because he didn't play all last year. Well, he has pretty much played his way into those events. And so he doesn't need to play every single week anymore. Um, to, to get in. So I don't think it's very likely that we're going to see Will Zalatoris at like some jabroni event. Like, like we're going to see Will Zalatoris in the signature events and in the majors. Um, and I don't think we're going to get him in a whole lot of events where he is going to be like by and large the favorite. You know, we could have had one of those at Mexico and he withdrew. So I really do like Will Zalatoris this week. I think this is a great spot to use him. If you are committing to using four live guys in the majors, which I don't think you have to do, but I think you can do, then this is a great spot for Will Zalatoris. Will Zalatoris is a great player in major championships, and I think that would be a prime spot to use him in. So what's the closest thing to using him in a major? using him this week at the Players' Championship. Um, he's probably as far down the board as I would be willing to go, though. Um, 
So the pick that I'm making here um, for this one that I have picked every week here on the show, um, I have already used Justin Thomas. I have already used Jordan Spieth. I have already used Max Homa, who I think are all great options this week. Um, and I'm sitting in, in the back half of the pack. So what I'm going to do this week here in this one is I'm going to use... Let me see if I can find him. I'm going to use Sam Burns this week. Um, I don't think a lot of people are going to be on him. I think this is a great spot for him. And I think I can figure it out at the other two courses that I would need to um, play him at. All right, so that does it for this week, y'all. So if you do want more information from me, there are a few places you can get it. You can follow me on Twitter at Mike's Money Picks. Um, also, while you're here on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on audio, please rate and review for me. It helps me out a ton. If you like what you saw in this episode, come back for more. Come back for all the college basketball content you're going to get in the next two weeks as well. Um, also, I'm in the Fantasy Corner Discord. The link is in the description. Um, if you want to join that, that's a lot of smart people who play DFS for a lot of different sports. Golf is one of them. Um, and there have been a lot of a lot of good people in there to bounce ideas off of and talk DFS and talk strategy with if you play golf DFS. And we already mentioned on the Patreon, you can get my article where I do a full write-up every week for every event where I profile my model top 10, my process, and who ends up making my DFS core. All right, so that does it for the Players' Championship 2024. Best of luck to you guys this week, whether you are playing DFS, betting, one and done, showdown DFS, underdog drafts, whatever. Best of luck to you. Hopefully I gave you guys plenty of information that you need to pick some winners this week. Thank you guys for watching and listening, and I will see you guys next time.